Please look at Job 14, would you? Now, when some people hear the biblical teaching on this subject, they're upset. I thought my dear grandmother was playing a harp up in heaven. But if you press them about all their relatives and inquire did all the relatives go up, they will ultimately confess, no, that some of them went down in their thinking. And so they have to balance the joy of grandma playing a harp up yonder with that old skinflint, Uncle Ebenezer, in eternal fire down below. So then it's not so happy, is it? Look here at Job 14. Verse 12, man lies down and does not rise till the heavens are no more. Men will not awake or be raised, roused from their sleep. Sleep. At least 60 times the Bible calls death a sleep. And when I take a funeral service, I usually remind people, the next thought after death for the saints is the thought of the resurrection and the coming of Christ. It's a moment's sleep, however long. It will seem no longer for Abel than for the last martyr. You know, 70 million Christians have been martyred in this Christian era. 70 million. But the time that Abel was in the grave will seem no longer to him than the time that the last martyr is in the grave. Because death is a moment's sleep and then resurrection. That's the biblical teaching. Look here, further. We're noticing that he's spoken about man lies down, does not rise till the heavens are no more. They'll not awake or be roused from their sleep. If only you would hide me in the grave, conceal me to your anger is past. If you'd set me, set me a time and then remember me. If a man dies, will he live again? All the days of my hard service, I'll wait for my renewal to come. You'll call and I'll answer you. You'll long for the creature your hands have made. So that's the biblical teaching. Let's look at the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 15. Romans, Corinthians. 1 Corinthians and verse 15. The word immortal in the KJV occurs once. We notice it's applied to God. The word immortality occurs five times and most of them are in this passage in 1 Corinthians 15 and beginning please verse 51. I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, meaning we'll not all die. Some will be alive when Jesus comes. But we'll all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. When this mortal shall put on immortality, then it shall be brought past the saying, death is swallowed up in victory. So the biblical teaching is a man falls asleep in death, only seems a moment, and at the second coming of Christ, he's raised either to immortality or to judgment day if on the second resurrection for the wicked. That is the biblical teaching. Now here's something interesting. In the last 50 years, the Christian world has greatly changed on this issue. When I was a boy in the Anglican church where I met many wonderful people, including many great ministers, I heard a sermon or two when I was a teenager that I could almost reproduce now. But they were very definite that at death you either go to heaven or hell. That you are naturally immortal. William Tyndale, who had most to do with the 
The KJV, in its original form, did not believe that. John Milton, the greatest of English poets, did not believe that. Gladstone, the greatest of English prime ministers, did not believe that. And I could go on and on and on. But the interesting thing is that since I was a boy, there's been a great change in Christendom. Now in every great denomination, most of the scholars agree with what I have just said. Now here's an example. Oscar Kuhlman's one of the most famous of 20th century theologians. He wrote this book, Immortality of the Soul or Resurrection of the Dead, in which he said, in essence, what I've been saying to you. But the point is, he represents a host of men, scholars, not all the ministers have caught up, and certainly not the parishioners. The parishioners still believe in heaven and hell. But many of the scholars, by the hundreds, Dr. Ellie Froome wrote a book on the nature of man and he lists hundreds of scholars that are saying what this book says and what the Bible says. Remember scripture says in the most well-known verse, God so loved the world, gave his only begotten son, whoever should believe in him should not what? Perish. Perish. Now perish doesn't mean living on in hell for eternity. Perish means perishing. 1 John 5, 11 and 12 says, This is the record God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. And whoever has the Son has life, whoever has not the Son has not life. Isn't that clear? God's given us. It's a gift. You can't earn it. Can't buy it. Can't deserve it. It's for the unrighteous. He justifies the ungodly. It's for penitent thieves. It's for Zacchaeus. It's so Barabbas can go free. He that hath the Son has life. This is known as conditional immortality. What's the condition of living forever? Being in Christ. When? Today. Don't put it off. Jesus of Nazareth passes by. Don't let him pass you by. It's only the work of a moment to accept Christ. But if in accepting him we fall in love with him, all of life is different thereafter because the Spirit of God comes to live. And that changes things, changes our loves, changes our hates. We come to reflect Jesus. That's the evidence we really believe when we come to reflect Christ. So here's a parable where Christ meets the people where they are, but not altogether where they are because he talks about the grave and he talks about the tongue and he talks about the finger. So it's not the traditional view, but he's saying, whatever you believe, understand this, there's no change after death and death is tomorrow. Death is tomorrow. I spoke to a group in Sydney on Saturday and one of the last things I said to them was, we prob I probably will never see you all again. I often say that when I speak to a group because someone will die before I'm there again. It may be me, but someone will go. Life is very transitory. And you and I made of such strange stuff when we hear of a friend dying we sort of feel special that we've survived. My friends, we're no more special than the brother or sister that's died. And one day people will remember us. Remember Des, he talked a lot, but what, you know? <laughs> we'll go too, unless Jesus comes first, which is not impossible, and for which we all pray. But the important thing is, how am I living this day? Not how will I live next week when I repent. How am I living this day? And if I should have an accident when I leave this venue on my way home, will it matter? Not if I have Christ. Not if I have Christ. Never forget the best things are free and salvation is free, but because we're all fools, we tend to neglect the best. But this story is here and it's saying to us, son, daughter, remember. 
It has many subsidiary lessons. It's saying the fact that a person is rich doesn't mean that God esteems them highly. We do. We say, boy, he's smart or she's smart because they're rich. They should have our sympathy. Very few, very few people comparatively find Christ. It's not easy. After the age of 20, the numbers who find Christ go down and down and down. The vast majority of Christians have been converted between the age of 12 and 17. So life is fleeting and this little story is saying, remember, remember, death is coming. Be ready for it. And the rest of the book tells us how to be ready. Whoever believeth in him has eternal life. Right now. Right now. I like the little bit about dogs. I happen to like dogs. And I have a close friend with whom I often walk and he tells me every time I walk with him, I prefer dogs to people. Nevertheless, he walks with me. <laughs> but I like the bit about the dogs. The dogs had sympathy with the poor man Lazarus, licked his sores. Rich man had no sympathy. The rich man was living for himself. Now there's the test. Am I living for myself? If so, I'll go where he went. Am I living for myself? He was living it up. But death came. You know, I think of people who are very rich, and I often think of Howard Hughes. You know, Howard Hughes ended up paying $5,000 a day to survive, and he couldn't move. And he was giving himself drug injections by the needle repeatedly through the day. He watched one movie, he had it all set up in his bedroom, 105 times. But he couldn't get out, he couldn't do anything. He was the richest man in the world. Howard Hughes. There are a lot better riches than dollars. If you've got good health, you're very rich. If you have Christ, you're richer than anyone else who doesn't have him. So it's a very pertinent story for all of us because we're all, all temporary people.